talking in John 3 about uh, this matter of the kingdom. And remember, the kingdom of God is important to Nicodemus. It's important to all of us. <laughs> the kingdom of God is where you're going to spend eternity. The kingdom of God wasn't just this earthly thing. It's the heavenly thing. Where are we going to be? And Nicodemus was very interested in the kingdom of God. He'd been teaching, preaching, and anticipating the kingdom of God coming. And therefore, whenever Jesus is coming and he's preaching about the kingdom, and he says that he's the entrance into the kingdom, Nicodemus takes note of that. As he takes note of that, he begins to come and he says, Talk to me about who you are. Who are you and what are you doing? And Jesus begins to reveal to him truths about the kingdom of God. Where are you going to spend eternity? And how do you know that you're going to have an eternal existence with a holy God in his kingdom? A very important truth. Very important thing. It also has to do with death and dying. Because death is a reality. It's appointed unto every man to die once. After that, there's the judgment. Every person is going to die who's ever lived, save two. One who walked with God and was no more, and one, Elijah, who was carried up. Other than that, all have faced death. And the only way that we get out of this existence, unless Jesus comes, uh, is the fact that we're going to die. So death is a very important thing. We've been talking about that. We talked about the two deaths, remember? There are two deaths. The first death is physical death. And the second death, recorded in the Bible, is spiritual death. To be eternally separated from God. Well, whenever you were born physically, you begin to die at that point, and you will eventually die physically. But the second death is the fact because there was sin, because Adam and Eve sinned, the second death that they would be eternally separated from God in a place of torment. And the only hope that we have is in order to not experience that, we had to be born spiritually or born again. And whenever we were born again, we don't have to worry about or face the second death. Second death, we don't have to be concerned about that because Jesus died in our place and he gave to us life. We don't have to be concerned about the first death. But hold on. What about this first death? This first, de first death, the physical death, is still a reality for believers and unbelievers. So what is there about the physical death? Why is it that we, even though we're saved and Christians, why is it that we're still having to go through that Physical death, why do we have to be touched by the first death? Well, the Bible tells us why and what has to happen regarding that. We want to focus on that today. I want to read in John 3 what Jesus says to Nicodemus beginning in verse 9. Nicodemus says, answered and said to him, How can these things be about being born again, being born spiritually? How can these things be? Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Hear what Jesus said? What I'm telling you, I'm telling you about what I know. I'm telling you about what I've seen. Because Jesus was unique, different from any other person. Every other person had been created and brought into life because God gave to them life in that embryo in their mother's womb, and they came into life. That was whenever they began to exist, but not Jesus. Jesus had pre-existed. Jesus pre-existed. He had been forever and ever in eternity with God. And whenever He came to this world, He left the glory of heaven, and He came to this earth. And he took on the form of man as a bondservant. But Jesus knew the heavenly things. He had been in the heavenly places. What he speaks of, he speaks of because he knows it. He bears witness of that which he knows about, very important, about the heavenly things, about eternal life, about the kingdom of God. Jesus knows about it. Now look what else he says. In verse 12, you need to underline this phrase, these phrases. If I told you earthly things, you need to underline a circle that. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Circle that statement. Heavenly things. And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. In other words, the only one who's qualified to talk to you about heaven, the only one who's qualified to talk to you about heavenly things, 
is the Son of Man. For no one has ascended into heaven and come back. But rather, it is the Son of Man, or the Son of God, who has been in heaven and who descended from heaven to this earth. And he can talk to you and tell you, Nicodemus, and us, about heaven, about the heavenly things. Now, the reason I want you to circle those two phrases is because you need to get in your mind what Jesus is saying. Jesus says there are two things that you need to realize. One thing is there's earthly things. There are the things of earth. We are very familiar with earthly things. We know things of earth. We know what we can touch and taste and hear and feel and smell. We know those earthly things. We can relate to earthly things. But he says, hold on. There are not just earthly things. There are heavenly things. Those heavenly things, those spiritual things. And you need to realize, he says to Nicodemus, that we're not just talking about earthly things. We're talking about heavenly things. We're talking about kingdom things. And who best is qualified to talk to you about that? It is Jesus, the Son of God. The Son of God. Now, let's talk about those earthly and heavenly things. Are the earthly and spiritual things. Remember, the first death is earthly death, right? It's the death of this physical body that is perishable and mortal and corruptible and is dying all the while and will eventually wear out and eventually die. And death is going to happen. Those are the earthly things. But in regard to the spiritual things, we found out that that spiritual torment or separation from God, spiritual death, are because of what Jesus is going to do, die on that cross, what he did for us, the price that he paid. He offers to us the privilege of being born again so that the spiritual things could be settled. Spiritual death has been paid for, and spiritual life has been gifted to us. But there's still this matter of the earthly things. What is there, and why are we still touched by that physical death, even though I'm saved? I'm glad you asked that question. Because I want you to look in your Bible to the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul addresses this matter because it's an important matter. Important question about why or what happens whenever we die as Christians. Well, I want you to see something there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to realize one thing to begin with. Whenever you and I get saved... We've been changed. You need to write that down. When you got saved, you were changed. Did you know it? You were changed. It was a real change. I mean, I hope that you saw the real change in your life. Because you had been dead in your sin and now you're alive to Christ. You'd been void of His presence and now the Holy Spirit lives in you. Whenever the Holy Spirit came into my life, He made a real change in my life. Matter of fact, it's not just a real change. It's a wonderful change. It's a wonderful change. I am so glad that Jesus came into my life. I'm glad of what Jesus has done in my life. There is no doubt in me that he made a wonderful change. A wonderful change. Here's the other part. It's a spiritual change. It's a spiritual change. Whenever I got saved, what happened? It changed me spiritually. It didn't change how I looked. I was a seven-year-old boy. And the day I got saved, I looked exactly the way I did before I got saved. It didn't change me physically. It changed me spiritually. It changed my eternal destiny. So it was a real change happened in my life, happened in your life if you've been saved. It's a wonderful change. It's good. And it's a spiritual change that happens in your life. But we got a problem. All of us have got a problem, even though we've been changed. Even though we, we, all those things happen, we got a problem. Here's the problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. That's what it says. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Do you hear our problem? What's our problem? Our problem is that even though we had a real change, a wonderful change, and a spiritual change in our lives, we are still what? Flesh and blood. Uh-oh. We got a problem. We are still flesh and blood. And what does the Scripture say? It says this, that 
flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is eternal. The kingdom of God is incorruptible. The kingdom of God is imperishable. And the only ones who can inherit that are the immortal. And we are not immortal. We have mortal bodies. We have perishable, corruptible bodies. We are flesh and blood. And here's the problem. We cannot inherit the kingdom of God in our flesh and blood. That means that there's got to be another change. There's got to be a final change. A final change. He hints at that in verse 51. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we shall all be changed. You need to circle that. All must be changed. In order for us to inherit the kingdom of God, in order for us to go to glory, there's got to be another change. You know what that change is? That change has to do with our flesh and blood. That change has to do with our mortal bodies. That flesh, that flesh and blood, that perishable, that corruptible body, it can't inherit it. There's got to be another change. For you to go to glory, for you to have the kingdom of heaven, for you to be in the presence of God, there's got to be another change. Now, here's the reality. Write this down. There are two ways that those change or that change can happen in your life. All right? Two ways that that change will happen in your life. For you to be able to inherit the kingdom of God, for you to go to glory, one of two things are going to happen in your life. The first way that you are changed and I, are cha- and I am changed is this. You die and are resurrected. Okay, that's the way it has to happen. You die and you get resurrected. He speaks about that, all right? Turn back. I have to turn back. You might not have to. Turn to look at verse 42. He's going to talk about this aspect of death and resurrection. Here's what he says. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. In other words, when we die, what do they do? They sow it. They put it in the ground. A perishable body, this old flesh and blood. It is sown a perishable body. Listen, it is raised, the resurrection, an imperishable body, distinctly different than the body we have. It is sown in dishonor. That means sown with the marks of sin, with the results of sin upon it. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. You know what your new body is going to be? A glorious body. What else? It is sown in weakness. Does your body have weaknesses? Yes, it does. If you don't think you have a weakness, just catch a virus. Amen? Man, a few weeks ago, we, we decided we we're going to share a virus with everybody in the family. Y'all like to share viruses? I mean, I put on mine no trespassing, but it did not matter. They were sick, and the next day I was sick. We all went on vacation, and everybody got sick. And that's a great time to go vacation when everybody's got the virus, right? Well, you know one thing a virus will do? It'll make you realize how weak you are. It'll make you realize how weak and vulnerable you are. Your old body, it is weak. Listen, but it's going to be raised in what? In power. Distinctly different. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. You got it? So in order for you and me to experience this change whereby we can go to heaven and we can enjoy the kingdom of heaven, we're going to have to have the change. And most of us and all of those who preceded us, the way that they experience that change is they experience death And then they're going to have resurrection. There's the death and the resurrection. And through that, you take the flesh and blood, the mortal, it becomes immortal. That that old body that's weak, it becomes powerful. That which is dishonor, it comes in glory. The way that we experience that final change where we can have the kingdom of heaven is through death and resurrection. Death 
and resurrection. Now, let me show you the, how that, what order of that existence is. How does that existence happen? It tells you the order of it. Listen, verse number 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and then the spiritual. What does that mean? Before you ever came to life spiritually, you were alive physically. That's right. You were alive physically, okay? You were birthed into the world, and you were given life, and you walked around here in your weakness and in your flesh and in your sin, and then something happened. You experienced that wonderful, real, spiritual change. And that spiritual life comes after the natural life or the physical life. Look at verse 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy, and the second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Hold on a second. First man, second man, what it's talking about? Glad you asked. I skipped the verse. Look at verse 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, we talked about him, Adam and Eve, became a living soul. Remember, God breathed in him a life, became a living soul. And the last Adam, that's who? That's Jesus. Jesus is the last Adam. The last Adam became a what? A life-giving spirit. What's the difference in Adam? Adam was a living soul. God breathed in him to life. Who is Jesus? Jesus comes as a life-giving spirit. He came in order to give spiritual life to you and me. The way we had that change in our life, that real wonderful change in our life, is because Jesus is the life-giving spirit, and he came and brought forth that change. So he's talking about two men, Adam and Jesus. Adam of the earth, Jesus of the spirit. Now go back and look at it again, and you can see it in verse number 47. The first man, who's that? Adam is from earth, earthy. And the second man, who's that? Jesus. Jesus is from where? He's from heaven. You got to get that in your mind. You got to get that in your heart. He's from heaven. Go on. As is the earthy, Adam, so also are those who are earthy. Who's that? Us. Us. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Who are those? Those who've been redeemed, right? Those who are saved. Those who've been born from above. Those who are born again. They are heavenly. How? Because Jesus is the one who gives life. Look at verse 49. And just as we have borne the image of the earthy, in other words, you bear the image of Adam. Every one of us bear the image of Adam. We're Made like Adam, and we also have the old sin nature like Adam. Amen? We have the image of the earthy. Listen, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We shall have the opportunity of being in His image. We have the opportunity of walking in His spirit. We've been transformed. Now, we've already had that happen. Real wonderful spiritual change in our life. But in order to get to the kingdom of heaven, in order to exist there where God is, what was our problem? We got to deal with this old flesh and blood. And how do you deal with the flesh and blood? There's one way. One way. We've talked about. You got to die. And, and whenever you die, you will be resurrected brand new. You'll be resurrected with a body that is going to be equipped to be in the very presence of God. It is going to be a glorified body. That's what we talk about. The glorified body, full of glory and power. The it is a heavenly body made in the uniqueness, by the uniqueness of God, equipped to be in the presence of God. And how does that happen? The first way that you'll be changed, the more typical way that we know of being changed, is that we die in our flesh and blood and we are resurrected. Okay? But there's another way. He says that we can be changed. I'm voting for this one. What about y'all? I'm voting for this one. Where does he say that? Look at verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. 
We shall not all sleep, and sleep is referring to what? To death. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. What's that talking about? That's talking about the coming of Christ. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. Listen to what happens. He describes it. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's as fast as you can blink. Now imagine this. You blink, and I'm sitting here earthly and fleshly, and you blink, and I'm glorified and heavenly. Blink and see if that happens. <laughs> in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Now when does he say that happens? For the trumpet will sound, announcing what? The coming of Jesus. The trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised. Oh, right here. The dead, those who have died, will be raised first, and they're raised perishable. Is that what your Bible says? They're raised what? Imperishable. That's right. They're raised imperishable. They've got those glorified bodies. They've got those changed bodies. They've got those bodies ready for glory. They'll be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Man, at the second coming of Christ, if you hadn't be alive at that point, whenever that happens, man, I'm telling you, twinkling an eye, you're going to be changed. You're not going to go through death and resurrection. You're not going to have to. He's going to change you like that. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I am hoping that I am alive when the rapture happens. I'm hoping that I have the opportunity of going up. What about you? Man, I, I'm, I'm excited about that. I really hope that I get to do that, experience that. You say, well, you don't want to go through that death stuff? Just soon not. <laughs> I mean, death, resurrection versus being changed in the twink of an eye and getting to go up and be with Jesus, which one do you choose, Right? All right. Now, the truth of the matter is everybody, in order to be changed, everybody, in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven, everybody is going to have to have the experience of being changed. One through death and resurrection, and the other through being changed in the twinkling of an eye because Jesus comes and the end of time is here, and he's got to get us ready to go to be with him. That's what happens. Now, hold on a second. What does he say then? What does he say is the revelation that happens to us? There's a revelation that happens to us whenever we experience this physical change. Whenever we go through this experience of this change. Whether that be through death and resurrection or whether it be through the fact that we're changed in the twinkle of an eye. Look what he says is the revelation. <clears throat> it says, for this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. How? either through death and resurrection or through the twinkle of an eye when Jesus comes. Listen to verse 54. You need to underline this. But when this perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal which will have put on immortality, when that happens, then comes about the saying that is written. Now hold on a second. Before we read about the revelation, let's talk about it. Whenever this change happens to us physically, Mortal puts on immortality, the imperishable puts on imperishable, corruptible puts on incorruptible. Whenever this change happens, whether that be through death and resurrection or whether it be through the fact that we're changed in the twinkle of an eye when Jesus comes, it does not matter which way. But whenever you walk through that door, whenever that experience happens to you and you walk through physical death, okay, this is what will be the revelation. Then comes about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. And here's what he says. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Hear what he says? He says, whenever it happens, whether it's going to be death and resurrection or whether the fact that Jesus takes us up and change, whenever it happens... We're going to have a testimony. We're going to have a revelation. We're going to say, wow, that wasn't even bad. Death that I've dreaded all of my life. Death that has been overpowering me and controlling me. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? Where's it? All this time I've been dreading it. All this time I've been fearful of it. All this time it has held me captive. And it was nothing. It was just moving out of one existence. That is a weak existence, a mortal existence, a flesh and blood existence. Into a glorious, powerful existence. I'm going to back up and I'm going to say, wow. Death has no victory. You know, I don't know what you've thought about whenever you think about going to heaven. Whenever you think about death. I know most of us think about Peter's going to be there at the gate. You know, and going to let us in and our friends are going to be there. and We're going to get to see Jesus. You know what I think? You know what I think everybody gathers at, at, at heaven's gates to hear, first of all? I don't think they gather at heaven's gates to greet their friends. I, I don't think they gather at heaven's gates just to see Jesus. I think everybody in heaven gathers at heaven's gate just to see the expression and response of everybody who arrives. Can't you imagine? Hey, come on, let's go, let's go down by the gate. <laughs> There's some others coming. And we want to hear them say that, that which we said. Whenever they show up, and whenever they show up, they say, Wow! This is great! Death has no victory. Death has no sting. Death has no control. This is glorious. But remember, only two ways to get there. Through death and resurrection, or through being changed at the coming of the Lord when the trumpet sounds. Now, he takes us back to the beginning, though. Where did death have that victory? Where did death have that sting? Listen to what he says in verse 56. The sting of death is sin. You know when death started affecting human life? We talked about that. Adam and Eve sinned. They, were, they didn't even have the existence of death. Whenever they were created. Had the presence of death. Matter of fact, it's whenever God told us that if you, whenever you sin, you'll die. When you sin, death comes. And, and what was the sting? The sting of death is sin. Death entered into the human existence. Death entered into human history because man sinned. Listen. And the power of sin is the law. Every one of us are sinners. You know how you know you're a sinner? Because the law. The law says don't do this, and you do it, you sin. And, and there's something about our old nature that wants to sin. Did you know that? Our old nature likes to sin. A have you ever been tempted when it says don't touch? That you just, something about you just wants to touch it, you know? It says don't speed. You just want to speed. You know, so you ever have that problem? Don't look so holy. I mean, you're not supposed to do something and, you, and you're tempted to do that. Why? Because the old sin nature takes place where the law says not, sin says do. Where the law says do, sin says not. That's sin. And, and sin's evident in all of us, and, and that is the sting of death. But you know what? Jesus took care of that at the cross, didn't he? And the final ultimate victory is whenever we leave this old flesh and blood body, this old mortal, perishable body, and we're going to go in the presence of God. Now, listen to what he says. Here's the, here's the glory. Listen. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. You ought to underline verse 57. You ought to memorize it. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory over what? Over death, over sin. Who gives us the victory over the old flesh and mortal body. He is the one who has given to us the ultimate victory. Thanks be to God who gives to us the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what Paul says? He says, if you get that settled in your heart and mind, and he's, he's right. You get this settled in your heart and mind, he said you can do this. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, 
Always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. You know what he says? Stop worrying about death. Stop being concerned about living and dying. Stop concerned about how you're going to get there. It's all settled. You're going to get there because of Jesus. Listen, focus on the fact of being steadfast, immovable. Focus on doing the work of the kingdom of God. Focus on things that really matter in eternity. Because the matter of death has already been settled. You're going to have to go through it. You're going to have to experience it. But you don't have to worry about it. All right? Because it's going to be a glorious experience for you. A glorious experience for you. For all? No. For those who know Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God who gives to us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, Death, physical death, to a redeemed believer is totally different than to an unredeemed lost man. Death to a lost man means that they're about to enter into a position and place of eternal separation and torment from the presence of God. They're about to enter into that, and there is no hope for them ever being changed. That will be their eternal existence. I want to tell you something. If I was a lost man and all I knew that was facing me out there and I had no hope of living eternally and being in the presence of God, I'd be clinging to life with all I had. I'd be dreading death as nothing I could imagine. I would not want to even think about death. I wouldn't want to talk about death. I don't want anybody bearing about death around me because death there is a portal into an existence that is far worse than any of us could ever imagine. But that's not true for a believer. All because of what Jesus did on the cross. What he did on the cross. This week in my office, I was sitting down, I was just thinking about, about death and about what it means to us. Here are a few statements that I want you to maybe write down about death. Death is moving out of one reality, the worldly reality, into another reality, the heavenly reality. Death is an, ex is an exchange. It's an exchange of that which is inferior to that which is superior. Isn't that true? <laughs> I'm here to tell you. If you know somebody that's saved and who, who was saved and who went to glory... They would not exchange where they are. Matter of fact, if you brought them back, they'd be upset. What'd you do that for? Why'd you go messing me up? Man, do you know where I was? You're talking about an exchange of that which is inferior for an exchange for that which is superior. Death is not the culmination of life, but rather the transformation of life. Death is the farewell of some unwanted friends. Pain, sorrow, weariness, worldliness. Any of y'all want to carry that with you? Death is the farewell of some unwanted friends and the greeting of new friends. Peace, joy, love, life, power. You know, everybody writes on their tombstone, they have date of birth, dash, date of death, right? That's what they have. Date of birth, dash, date of death. Well, let me tell you something. I decided on my tombstone, there are going to be two dates. There are going to be two series of dates. Date of physical birth, dash, date of physical death, unless the rapture happens, Amen. But below that, it's going to be date of spiritual birth, dash, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> because there is no end. When I was a seven-year-old boy and gave my heart to Christ, my eternal life started then, and there is no end. I want you to realize death's a reality. I want you to realize it's something that we may go through. But you want, I want you to realize that Jesus knew about it. 
He told Nicodemus, listen, you don't even understand fully earthly things. How will you ever understand the heavenly things? But I can tell you about it because I've been there. I've seen. I know the reality of spiritual life as well as physical life. And the good news is this. From here on, Jesus has talked about the kingdom. He's talked about heavenly things. He's talked about death and dying and living forever. But from now on, he's going to tell Nicodemus who it is, him, who makes the way. Who it is that provides the hope. Who who it is that opens the portal of the kingdom of heaven and the opportunity to go to glory. And he's going to show Nicodemus it's not in some series of laws. It's not in keeping rules. You've got to find it in a man, in him, him Jesus. Thanks be to Jesus. Thanks be to God who gives to us the victory in Jesus Christ. Do you know him? You know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If you don't, you need to know him. I'm here to tell death is a reality. We do not know when it happens. It can sneak up on us. You have opportunity now to settle that issue. Settle in your heart that you know where you'll be. That you know that whenever death happens, it's going to be something glorious for you rather than something that everybody dreads. It's an opportunity to move into the superior and leave the inferior if you know Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't know him, you need to give your heart to Jesus today. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for truth. Thank you for the word.